Uh, let's take out our Bibles. Uh, Titus chapter 2. Uh, open your sermon notebooks. Uh, if you need a sermon notebook or a Bible, there are some available um, for $10 just as you leave. If you're a visitor among us, feel free to take one for free. We would love that uh, to be our gift to you today. Let me pray. Uh, gracious God and Heavenly Father, I pray now that you would grant to me, your servant, to continue to speak your word with all boldness, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Amen. Uh, well, here's where we're going this morning. Uh, thinking through Titus chapter 2. Uh, Titus chapter 1, obviously it was last week. Uh, feel free to go back and watch it. It's up on the website. Uh, and on our YouTube page, uh, you can catch up on uh, what we did last week. Let me give you a quick recap. Um, the book of Titus is written and addressed to Titus, and yet it is written uh, to the whole church um, on this island called Crete. Uh, Paul instructed Titus before he left Crete uh, in what Titus should do, uh, but then he writes him a letter to be read to the whole church so that the whole church knows what Titus is meant to do. And what Titus is meant to do is two things. He is to um, appoint elders amongst all the churches. Uh, so uh, these men who will uh, lead and guide the churches. And he is to teach and live rightly. Appoint elders, teach the truth and live rightly. Uh, Paul starts chapter 2, verse 1, But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. The you there is singular, right? A particular word to Titus. Titus, you are to teach what accords with sound doctrine. But it's not just that Titus is to teach. Titus is to live. Look with me at chapter 2, verse 7. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity, dignity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Um, Titus is the one who is to appoint the elders who are to be models of teaching and uh, living for the Lord Jesus Christ. But Titus himself is not above being a model. As for you, Titus, you are to teach what is true and live, be a model, verse 7, of good works. And this is really the, the flavor of chapter 2 of Titus. Nobody in the body of Christ is above being a model. Nobody is above being a model. Okay? Titus must be a model. He must be a model in what he teaches, the healthy teaching, the sound doctrine, those things that Paul has taught him. And he must be a model of godly living. And at the end of chapter 1, Paul talks about these false teachers that will arise and one of the things that they will have about them is verse 16, they will deny God by their works. Right? So this living is crucial. Healthy teaching, a model of good works. This is what Titus is to be to the whole church. And, and nobody in the church is above this. Which is what Paul goes on to say in verses 2 onwards. Everyone in some way is to be a model of what it is to follow Jesus, to live this life of good works. No one is exempt. No position in the church, be you an elder, be you a Titus, be you an apostle. No position is exempt. No gender is exempt. Men, women. No age group is exempt. Old, young. No social position in the community is exempt. Slaves, obey your masters. Every person is to be a model to somebody else. And Paul starts in verse 2, Older men, 
to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love, in steadfastness. I was reading a commentary this week and they said, this is spoken to the grey beards amongst us. Well, there's not many beards in the room. Roger Clifford and I. Anybody else? Dina's got one. Ian's got one. Yeah. This is not just to the bearded men, can I say. All those who are older. Now, the funny thing is... Here we go. We're all older than someone, aren't we? And particularly, Paul is saying, I'll teach the older men not to be flaky. Teach them not to be flaky. Teach them to be sound in faith, in love, in steadfastness. The older men are to be taught to be like the great trees. Stand tall, stand strong not blown around. They're to be the models of soundness, of stability, the models of dignity and self-control, of sober-mindedness. The older women, verse 3, likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children. Okay? Older women... And not to get drunk on wine. They're to be models of sobriety. They're to be models of teaching what is good, reverent in behavior. Younger women are to be taught to love their husbands and children, to be self controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands. Younger women are to be taught to be unkind. Sorry, not to be unkind. <laughs> They're to be taught to be kind, to model kindness to the world around them. Younger men, only one instruction. One instruction which I think covers everything that young men need to do, to be self-controlled in every way. Every person is to be a model, older men to younger men, younger men to the even younger men, older women to the younger women, younger women to the younger women. Everyone models to somebody. And again, like I said last week with the uh, word to the elders, I don't, want us to, I don't want us to get bogged down in kind of thinking about what does each one of these mean particularly, but to just understand that Paul is, is giving us a shape of a person. What's the older man who follows Jesus to look like? Well, he paints a picture as he does for every person. And he includes slaves. Verse 9, bond servants are to be submissive to their own masters in everything. They are to be well-pleasing, not argumentative, not pilfering, but showing all good faith. Slaves, don't steal. Treat your master well with respect. Treat his property, his products well. Nobody is above being a model of what it is to live and follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want to just pause here and think with you a little bit about slavery. Uh, it's an issue that uh, comes up often. It can be a criticism that comes up against people who follow Jesus. I don't know whether you've ever heard it. Sometimes people say, the Bible endorses slavery. And it, it's a word that comes up often. If You might have a footnote next to bond servants in your Bible, bond servants... Uh, the word is doulos in Greek, it just means slave. Slave is a good translation. So let's think about slavery for a minute. Um, in in the, the Bible, there are two kinds of slavery. Well, in, in the ancient world, there were two kinds of slavery, okay? It's really important that we get this fundamental distinction. 
The first kind of slavery is the buying and selling of human beings as economic units. The buying and selling of human beings as economic units, right? And, and this is the slavery that, that first comes to our mind. It's the slavery of the 18th and 17th and 16th century. It's the slavery that has been rampant all over the world um, almost forever. Where I, I capture you and I sell you so that I, make, make, I might make money and I sell you to someone else so that they might make money from you. And you are in that transaction and not a person you are an economic unit for somebody else's economic prosperity. Okay? That's the first kind of slavery, the buying and selling of human beings as economic units. And the Bible condemns that kind of slavery. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10. I'll read from verse 8. Paul says, we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient. And then he gives a big list of the reason that we have the law. Those who are unjust and lawless and disobedient are the ungodly and sinners, the unholy and profane, those who strike their fathers and mothers for murderers, for the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers. Now, you might have a footnote there next to the word enslavers, like my Bible does. That is, those who take someone captive in order to sell them into slavery. Liars, perjurers, whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. The practice of buying and selling people into slavery is contrary to the healthy teaching, the sound doctrine. So when someone comes and says to me, the Bible endorses slavery, I say, no, it doesn't. You haven't read the Bible. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10, it's condemned. There you go. There's a second type of slavery, though, that we need to think about. And this second type of slavery is, uh, is an economic structure. Okay, an economic structure that existed for thousands of years and it's an economic structure that existed to deal with poverty to deal with poverty uh, imagine that you're a farmer and uh, your crops fail one year now how are you going to deal with that with that scenario you have no crops you have no income so you have no money, and so you can't feed your family. What do you do? There is no safety net to catch you. There is no social welfare system. No one is going to come and give you a credit card, which some would argue is just modern slavery. <laughs> There's no government who are going to come and give you JobKeeper or JobSeeker. What do you do? Well, you might have a rich family member, you might beg, or you might sell yourself into slavery, which was an economic transaction. You might find a rich person and say to them, I will come and, and sell myself to you for a period of time and maybe my whole family with you and in exchange for our labor, uh, we will work for you and you will feed us and take care of us so that we won't die. Now, some people were born into that economic situation. Some people sold themselves into that economic situation. But it was an economic structure that existed to deal with the situation of poverty. And one of the things that the Old Testament commands is that every seven years, every slave be released. It's like the clocks are reset. The idea of being a slave for life is just uh, is something that the Old Testament works against. So there's this second type of slavery, which is an economic structure which exists to address poverty. Now, it's not a perfect structure. It's not a perfect system, but no system is. And any evils 
of the structure actually don't come from the structure, but come from the human heart. I mean, that's the problem with all systems, isn't it? The system on paper sounds great and works when you map it out on paper. The moment you put people into it, well, you get evil slave masters, wicked slave masters who mistreat their servants. You get slaves who steal, who don't do their jobs, who misappropriate funds. The problem is not the structure. The problem is the human heart. And so when the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ comes into the world, what does it do? It doesn't try to overturn the structure, this economic structure of dealing with poverty. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ transforms the heart. That's what it does. That's how it transforms the world. So people say, well, God could have busted into the world and overturned all the slavery. Well, he could have. But what do you do with the 50 million slaves in the Roman Empire? One third of the Roman Empire are slaves. You've suddenly got catastrophic um, scenario. And the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ comes and transforms the heart. The heart of the slave and the heart of the master. So that masters don't mistreat their slaves and slaves obey their masters. The gospel gives a new equality into the world where we are all children of God with one father and one Lord. And our hearts are transformed and it transforms the hearts of the whole church so that over the centuries, slowly, slowly, we do seek to transform the culture. We look at this economic structure and think, ah, it's not a great structure, is it? People having to sell themselves into slavery. And we actually start slowly, slowly to transform the world, which is what we did. It was the Christians who transformed the world. You think about all the countries in the world right now, today, who are most against slavery and who have the fewest number of those in economic or in in kind of um, evil slavery. Which are the countries? The countries with Christian heritage. Because that is what we've done. We have tried, we have worked to transform the world by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so when Paul speaks to slaves, he's not condoning this kind of evil type of slavery. He's already condemned that in 1 Timothy. But he is speaking to the people in this economic structure and he is speaking to transform their hearts. And so we have this question that arises from two Timothy, uh, from uh, Titus 2. Are we good models for the gospel? You and I, are we good models for the gospel? Because nobody is exempt from being a model. And our modeling is important. Look at verse 6, verse 5, sorry. Speaking to the young women, Paul says halfway through, that the word of God might not be reviled. Uh, He does it again. In verse 10, speaking to slaves, showing all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Saviour. Our lives as Christians adorn the gospel of God our Saviour. They give a beauty to it. They testify to its transforming power. But equally, They can mean our lives that the word of God can be reviled. If we claim to follow Jesus and yet do not show it in our works, in our lives, in our transformed character, the word of God is reviled. That's what Paul is saying. And we all know someone like that. We all know someone who calls themselves a Christian and yet we go, oh man, if that's what a Christian is, I'm not sure I want to be one. 
If that's what Jesus does to someone, I don't think he's worth following. And Paul is saying that is just not on. I came across this little quote from Spurgeon this week. He says, I would not give much for your religion unless it can be seen. Lamps do not talk, but they do shine. A lighthouse sounds no drum. It beats no gong. And yet far over the waters, its friendly spark is visible to the mariner. So let your actions shine out your religion. Let the main sermon of your life be illustrated by all your good conduct. And it shall not fail to be illustrious. My brothers and sisters, this week, let the sermon of your life be good conduct, zealous for good works. However old you are, whatever gender you are, let your light shine. Uh, And if you turn over, uh, verse 11, Paul gives us the reason. For the grace of God has appeared. Now, uh, the word for there, whenever you see it in your Bible, really important word, take note, it's the word because. You're being given the reason. Why is this so important? Why must we live this way of life? Well, because the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. Uh, One of the things that we as the church have got really clear in our heads is that the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ has done something for us um, in a kind of cleansing way. It has forgiven us. And that is true. It, It looks Back, it kind of un, undoes, in a sense, things that we have done. It's, it's a gospel of forgiveness, of setting free. That is true. But did you notice what Paul says? That the grace of God has appeared, by which he means Jesus came. He brought salvation, verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. The... the Death and resurrection of Jesus and his life doesn't simply forgive, but it sets in motion a transforming power. It trains us. It does something in us that is forward-looking. It does something in every follower of Jesus. It unleashes a power in us, the power of his spirit. It helps us to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age. Again, verse 14, it speaks about our Saviour Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us. There is the purchasing back language, the forgiveness language, the, the buying out of debt. But also to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. We are not just redeemed and set free, we are purified and part of that purifying work is that we become zealous for good works today, tomorrow, all of the tomorrows. Christians are a forgiven people, but we're not just a forgiven people. The gospel of Jesus Christ is more than you're bad, Jesus is awesome, but trust him and you'll go to heaven. It is that, but it is more than that. The gospel is also that Jesus is king, he's poured out his spirit, and he's teaching you right now how to live a transformed life. He's purifying you right now so that you might be zealous for good works just like he was. Our great model, Jesus Christ, and our transforming power. And so when we don't shine for him, 
When we don't follow his model, when we give up on the healthy teaching, when we are not models for good works, the danger is that we become the testimony that that power is not at work in our lives. We start to become like those in chapter 1 who deny God by their works. If people look at us as followers of Jesus and see no zeal for good works, no transforming power, they are right to say, well, are you a follower of Jesus? Because what Jesus does in a person is transform them. Now, yes, it takes time. And yes, none of us are perfect. And yes, we won't be perfect until we reach glory and Jesus returns. But the gospel does transform from day to day. It does transform from day to day. My brothers and sisters, more and more this week, allow the gospel, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, to transform your life and show it by your good works, your zeal for doing what is good. That is what this week is to be all about. If you have no other New Year's resolution than this one, let it be so today and this week that the gospel actually transforms you. Now, we often think about growing in godliness, the transforming power of God, like trying to push a boulder up a hill. We just think about it like hard work. I don't know if you've ever been in that prayer meeting and someone says, oh, I just, I just really need you to pray for me to be patient. It's just such hard work. And I've been in those prayer meetings. I've, I've said those prayer points. <laughs> where, where we make holiness and growth in godliness hard work. Uh, but I want to say... Growing in holiness, growing in godliness is not trying to push a boulder up a hill. That work of, oh, I'm just trying to be patient. I'm just trying to be faithful and kind. But I might just give up and let the boulder roll me down. It's not like that. Because this is a work that that God wants to do in your life. Growing in godliness is a work that God wants to do in your life and he has given you his spirit who will bring it about in you. He has given you his word so that you know what shape it is to take. Living a life zealous for good works is not trying to push a boulder up a hill. It is like being on a water slide. Hands up if you've ever been on a water slide. If you haven't been on a water slide, you should have a turn. They're pretty fun. But you know that feeling, don't you, when you get the mat and you sit at the top and all the water's rushing underneath you and you've got to like wiggle yourself to get going and it takes a little minute, doesn't it? And you kind of stick. But once the water gets underneath you, you just go for it, don't you? And that is growing in godliness. Sure, it takes a little while to get started. Sure, if you want to stick out your hands and make yourself stop, well, you can do that. But the whole force of the thing is behind you and pushing you. It's a good force, sending you forward, sending you on. My brothers and sisters, we are not trying to push boulders of godliness uphill. We're on the slide with the power of the Word of God and the person of the Holy Spirit and the model of Jesus Christ and the model of those around us, willing us, pushing us onwards, downhill, like a great rushing stream. And what we need to do is take our hands off the side and let that force take us. 
and guide us on to glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you uh, for these words. We thank you for the model of Paul and of Titus. And we thank you for the models that you have given us all down through the centuries. Most of all, we thank you for the model of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we ask that uh, we would give ourselves to his gospel, that we would give ourselves to his word, give ourselves to good works and be models to one another. And in that, would the world know that we are his disciples? Would we adorn the gospel of our great God and Savior? And we ask it in his name. Amen. All right. You want to ask questions? Is that a text question? Sally. Mm. 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 Yep. Thank you. Uh, Sally's question is, um, I use the the terms about no one is above being a model, which uh, kind of brings a sense of higher than others. What if it's the opposite where a person feels so below others that they don't feel like they can be a model? Is that right? Uh, Yeah. Well, I think I would encourage them that uh, no one is exempt Uh, and that we all have things to model. So it's important that we don't confuse modeling with gifts or modeling with function within a group. Uh, So just because someone might be further up in a position or in a more upfront role within the body doesn't make them any more or less of a model. I think we're all called to be models. Um, and we each model different things. Uh, and so s- for the person who feels um, like they can't be a model, I think I would say to them, actually, you can be and, and you should be, but you might be a model of just kind of like quiet, gentle, servant heartedness, and that in itself is a model. Um, there might be, someone might feel that they have done wrong in their lives and because of the wrong that they've done, they can't be a model. Maybe there's a sense of guilt for a person who thinks, oh, I could never be worthy to be a model. And I would encourage that person, if that were the case, to understand that... um, and I preached on this two weeks ago. If you listen to my sermon from the 20th on John 21, we talked about the only people who can properly testify to the gospel of Christ is the person who is forgiven. Which is why Peter, which is why Jesus forgives Peter and then commissions him. Okay? You can't be uh, a, a good evangelist you can't be a good disciple of Jesus if everybody thinks you're perfect and so actually it's our it's our imperfections which make us uh, worthy vessels of grace worthy testimonies of God's glory and so that person might not want to suddenly come out and you know declare everything they've done they might not suddenly want to jump into the spotlight but i think i would want to encourage them hey there really is a place for you as a model of the gospel of grace and you have gifts and as the holy spirit works in you um allow people to see what he is doing so that they might be encouraged does that answer your question thanks good ian The modern major general or? 
Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so Ian's question is, is there a difference between um, being a model to other Christians and then being a model maybe to uh, the, com- the community? Um, well, I would say we need to be both. Um, and, and Paul envisages us being both, that we're not just models here and not there. We're models everywhere to everyone. Uh, I think there is a difference um, that if you're going to step in a, into a position of leadership, I think that does bring a, a, a bigger shape of the model you are to be, which is why not all should presume to be leaders and why it's so decimating to a church community when the leader is um, found in sin or is, is seen not to be a model. Um, and there's plenty of that at the moment um, uh, around the world. So, no, I think we're to be models inside and outside. Um, and particularly leaders, you know, are, are to be those who um, have a good reputation with outsiders, you know, and it's almost, it's not less important for the church member to be a model, but it is more important for the leader to be such. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Ian's follow up is just about if a person was forgiven of a really sinful life. If I can use that phrase, terrible phrase, right? But you get what I mean. Uh, well, this was the example I was just thinking of. And Paul was a murderer. I mean, the whole church was scared of him when he first became a Christian. But uh, his forgiveness of being a murderer, of persecutor of the church, um, did not preclude him from being a model to the outside world. Um, it actually commended the transforming power of the gospel of grace, I think. So I don't think anyone's precluded from leadership. Last questions? Uh, Lauren. Yeah, yeah it's mine. Mm. yeah yeah thanks Lauren was that going to be your question as well no um Lauren's question is just about the charge that the Bible is sexist and you know tells women to be submissive and subservient and um uh look the you you can Here's, here's what I try and do. <laughs> um, it's the same way with slavery when someone comes back to me and says, oh, but Exodus 21, you know, it's all about slavery. You know, of course the Bible uh, is, for, is pro-slavery. My answer to them is, um, you won't understand Exodus 21 until you understand Jesus. Would you like to um, meet Jesus? Can I spend a few minutes telling you about Jesus? And they might say, no, I'm not interested. And at that point, I know that they're actually not interested in a conversation with me about the Bible. They're just using it against me for their own moral superiority. Right? Um, for, the, for the person, for any gender role, you know, for the man who doesn't want to lay down his life for his wife, <laughs> uh, I would say to him, and, and he says, oh, you know, the Bible just teaches men to sing and, you know, love flowers and grow beards and, you know like carry little lambs and be wusses. I would say to him, look, you won't understand the Bible until you understand Jesus. Can, I, can we take a few minutes to talk about Jesus? Because it's true. 
in the end, you, you actually can't understand the life that the Bible calls us to until you yourself have seen the life of Christ and seen it as good news for your life and be transformed by it and given yourself to him. And in that context, you hear what he says through the apostles and you think, well, I may not like it, but I trust him. And so I'm going to walk towards it slowly, trusting him. I mean, I don't like really what the Bible says in Exodus 21 about slavery, but I trust that God is good. And I trust that when he said it to the world, it was the right thing to do. But I do that from within a context of a relationship with Jesus. So my answer to that person would be, come and meet Jesus, because you won't understand anything until you understand him. And then I'll say a little prayer that they might say, sure, I'd love to. And then I would take them to John 1 and just, we just talk about Jesus. But yeah, thanks. SJ, last one. <laughs> Am I going to model the QR checkout? Yes, I will. I will. I modeled the QR check-in when I got here this morning. All right, friends, we're going to finish with a song.